right. Welcome, everybody. For the first time in uh, quite a long time, actually, this is the Showcase Webinar Series. Today is May 3rd, 2018. Uh, my name is Jonah Hobson. I'm coming to you from beautiful Woodland, Washington. I have Amanda Henry with me on this end. And today's Showcase Webinar is titled Accidents and Incidents, the Human Part. So we're lucky enough to have Bill Rigo with us as our HPI expert and our main presenter. And I will turn it over to him here shortly. So if this is your first time on the webinar, welcome. Thanks for joining us. The T in ITI stands for training, of course. Um, we conduct training we have for over 30 years. Uh, started in 1986 by Mike and Darlene Parnell. Um, but conducted in training, crane rigging, hoisting, lift planning training at client locations. We have open enrollment training centers throughout North America. There is online on-demand learning through ITI Online. Um, uh, something that's fairly new to us are VR training simulators, which we'll get to uh, a little bit more in a second. Reference center at the ITI bookstore, and you can find all of this at iti.com, just so you know. Um, also, a lot of free references and materials there that are available for download. Um, but yeah, please do check it out. So our virtual reality simulators were launched last year in March at Con Expo in Las Vegas. Um, you can see on the image here, we have our technical director, Joe Kuzar. It's kind of a picture in picture. Um, the, the VR part that you can see in the background um, it really doesn't do it justice because once you have the headset on, you have full 3D, full depth perception, everything. Um, but this kind of is kind of nice. It gives you an idea of what Joe, in this case, or the operator, is seeing. Um, he's actually explaining how to catch a swinging load. Um, this still, that's what that is from, and it's just amazing to be able to practice that multiple times within an hour without having to go set up. Um, a real crane, a course, and have somebody supervising and things like that. So the practice for new operators or uh, working on skills that you, you might not get to do every day at, as an operator is just amazing. So please check out more, iti.com slash VR. Um, and then the bullets, you can see there's a list of cranes and heavy equipment, which is on the way um, and will be available here soon. One other new development for us um, is Leadership in Industrial Technology, Education, and Safety, or LIGHTS, much easier to say. Um, and what it is really, it's a, well, as the infographic says, a collaborative ecosystem, but really it's bringing together folks um, from different industries who care about technology, innovation, growth, um, safety, and how that all ties in together. You can see some ideas here uh, of topics that we're talking about um, within the group. So VR, as we mentioned, but 3D scanning and mapping, there's modular construction, prefab stuff. Um, it's really, I mean, bringing the whole industrial umbrella um, and to embrace technology and, and get better, safer, and um, more efficient. So there are life's events. The next one is in June, coming up in Pittsburgh at the Energy Innovation Center. Um, really, life is a community, so it's a forum, uh, if you will, to, to just have these type of conversations. And there is a podcast, which just yesterday, the um, fourth episode, I believe, was released. And the guest on that one is um, the president of the Equipment Operations Division of Bechtel. So that's some great leaders, um, thought leadership on there, and just hearing their ideas is fantastic. So you can check that out at www.lites.org. Okay, so we're lucky enough, as I mentioned, this, I think this is our third webinar we've done with Bill. Um, you can see his illustrious career there, uh, a lot of time in the nuclear industry, uh, chief engineer on the USS Nimitz aircraft carrier. He is a um, Annapolis US Navy Academy um, graduate, and he's actually one of our instructors in our Fundamentals of Rigging Engineering program, which is fantastic, and we've had a pretty good reception on that since its launch in 2014. So thank you, Bill, for coming on. One last thing before I turn it over to Bill. Um, 
if you guys have questions, we want you to ask them whenever. Uh, you can ask them anytime at any point in the webinar. There is a question pane that you guys should see. Please just type it in there. Uh, Amanda and myself will be gathering those, and then time permitting, we'll, we'll address them over the air in the last 10 to 15 minutes with Bill. All righty. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Bill. You'll see it. just a quick delay here as he accepts control of the screen. All right. All right, Bill, we can see your screen. Cannot. Oh, yep. Okay. And we can hear you. So, yeah, go ahead and take it away. Good. Well, good morning good or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm on the East Coast today, so uh, I want to – it's a privilege to – talk to you all once again and uh, I, I want to talk to uh, to you today about accidents and incidents and and how humans get in the way of Newton's third law of physics so um, <clears throat> let's uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, first how Newton viewed the world and then I'm going to give you a new view and we'll ask the question are workers hazards or heroes and then I'm going to get into learning teams. Um, and in listening to the uh, the previous two uh, podcasts, the Lights podcasts, both with Bechtel and United Rentals, they've gone a long ways into getting worker engagement in learning so that they can improve significantly. So I, my hat is off to those two corporations that are learning the value of workers uh, and they're more heroes than they are hazards. Uh, so we'll get into learning teams, and then we'll get into the role of managers and supervisors as motivators for safety. So the first thing I wanna let you know is the first law of safety is to never take a sleeping pill and a laxative at the same time in any order. And sometimes engineers wanna know if that's if order is important, it's not. Um, the second corollary, or the first corollary to that is never remove a safety barrier that has a dent in it. So let's talk about the, the two views of failure. The first is the Newtonian view as represented by these uh, dominoes here. And um, so as, as one domino goes over, so, so go the rest of them. The second view is what we call complex adaptive. And it's more like this Jenga tower. And if you think about work, and the the company, you know, the workplace looks like the Jenga tower and workers are moving in and out and they're taking, you know, these blocks out of the Jenga tower. And at some point, the Jenga tower falls over and management asks the question that they always do, who touched it last? And what I'll tell you is, is um, everything that occurred after the worker who touched it last, you know, whatever happened, is due to the laws of physics. But what happened before the worker touched it has nothing to do with the laws of physics. And, and that's where we make mistakes. So um, Newton's laws of motion, for those of you who took physics and being a nuclear engineer, I took a lot of them, but, but it, it basically devolves down to these three laws, which is a body in motion stays in motion, a body at rest stays at rest unless acted on by another force. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration is the second law. And the third law is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And it's the third law that, that really shapes our thoughts on causal analysis. And so <clears throat> we, you know, most of us have experienced some form of a, a root cause analysis, but, you know, and, and there's lots of things that we've used. Uh, I, I know taproot is, uh, one way of looking at it, Apollo root cause analysis is another. There's more, to, <clears throat> and there's any number of, of mechanisms that you can use. But the the erroneous assumption is, is that we can back calculate an accident or an event back to its root, thus the root cause. And sometimes you hear this as switch theory where, you know, so many switches in a row shut and then the accident happens. Um, and what I will tell you is that every time within the Department of Energy world that I've done a, a human performance learning team in parallel with the root cause analysis, we've the, the human performance team 
the learning team has always found out more things than the root cause analysis team has found, and they come up with better solutions. So <clears throat> that begs the question, was Newton wrong? And I, I would submit to you that um, it's not that he's wrong, because in the physical world, he's certainly right. But let's talk about the new view, um, which gets to the, the root or the heart of how failure happens. So this is uh, a drift and accumulation curve. It's a multi-dimensional uh, accident perspective. And Todd Conklin, who's a PhD organizational psychologist, and I have, have looked at um, this representation, and we think it's pretty good. Um, but we also recognize that every tool, and this is a tool, Every tool is flawed, some are useful, and this is useful. So at the start of any job, there's this white line that represents work as imagined, or it's work as planned. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's your policies, procedures, it's uh, your signs, you know, whatever the managers and the work planners and the foremen believe defines the work to be done. And the reality is, is that workers from the pre-job brief on, they adapt to become successful. And they're, they're usually successful until there's an event. And, and so, oops, let me go back. Um, so that's normally successful until it's not and an event happens. And we look at that event in the context of the drift away from work as imagined or work as planned, and we go, how could they have drifted so much? You know, what was going on here? And um, and and I guess it's fine, but um, the reality is is that there are these hazards that um, build up over time that you can't see. So this these are things that are conditions. So it's rust, it's electrical degradation, it's weight that you can't see, like the um, that the boom on that crane on my opening slide that you know where the the crane tipped over, and on that particular crane there was no load. Um, so these are hazards that you can't see that build up over time, and where the hazard meets the work practice, the event happens. All right. So normal work is defined as the gap between work as imagined and work as done. Um, but the context, which is that gap between work is done and the actual hazard is where the learning take pla takes place. And that gap between the work is done and the hazard defines uh, really your resilience. So you see at the right side of that chart, your resilience, your ability to absorb errors is not very deep. But on the left side of that chart, where the, the delta between work is done and the actual hazard is pretty wide, your ability to handle errors as you go along is, is pretty broad. So, um, so are, are workers hazards or heroes? Um, and do we, are workers somebody that you know we've got to protect ourselves against because they're you know they make errors or are workers heroes because they're constantly adapting to to meet the context of their day whatever's going on um so that they can do the job safely and get it done on schedule um and i would submit to you that workers are heroes um, so when you look at investigations and when things go bad, you need to ask yourself the existential question, why do I do an investigation in the first place? Is it to blame and punish or is it to learn and improve? And the reality is, is you, you really can't do both. Um, so you may think that you, you really want to find out what happened and you don't want to blame and punish people. But if the outcome of every investigation that you do is that somebody gets disciplined, you do punitive training for everybody else, 
and you write some additional procedures that they weren't reading anyway, you're very likely, well, you are in the blame and punish mode and you're not in the learn and improve mode. So let's, let's look at learning teams. But before we do that, let's uh, do a little thought experiment. Uh, this comes from Danny Kahneman's uh, book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, Kahneman is the only uh, behavioral psychologist to win the Nobel for economics. Um, and so his book gets to the choices that we make that are economical. So a bat and a ball cost a buck ten. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So was your answer ten cents? When I initially looked at this, that's what I thought it was. But let's look at this. So if y is the price of the ball, x is the price of the bat, you do the algebra for this, and you find out that the price of the ball is really five cents. Now you can argue with this, but it's really true. And and once I figured that out, it, I felt really stupid. But the what Kahneman points out is is that your answer of ten cents, which is pretty close, is the result of fast thinking, and five cents is the result of slow thinking. So learning teams, as opposed to what we do most of the day, try to stay in the slow thinking mode uh, all the time or most of the time. So the phases of a learning team, uh, there's seven, and, and this is defined by Conklin in his book, Pre-Accent Investigations or Better Questions. So the first is, is to determine whether you need one or not. The second, do a, uh, uh, your first session in learning mode only. Then you provide some soak time. You go into the second session, session ideally the second day, and you start in the learning mode, but then you get into the doing mode after that. Then you uh, define your current defenses and you build new ones, you track actions to closure, and then you communicate, and this is very important, uh, what you found out to other applicable areas. So when, you, when you're trying to figure out whether you need a learning team or not, look at any place you see variants or where you get surprised. Um, some of these variances are more important than others. And uh, I used to be a Six, a six Sigma practitioner and I did a bunch of Six Sigma stuff and Lean stuff, and I know some of your companies do that as well. And, and the object of Six Sigma and Lean is to, is to reduce variability, ideally to less than Six Sigma. Um, so look at where you've got uh, variability. Uh, where is context important? Now, where you start uh, with the need for learning teams is where actual harm has taken place. So a crane falls over, you drop a load and somebody gets hurt. Um, you have a project that's significantly delayed because of an event. Um, those are certainly areas where you'd wanna do a learning team. The next priority would be near hits as I call them. Um, but the reality is, is that you don't have enough time or money to investigate really everything. So you've gotta be pretty selective. Uh, one company that I work with it was uh, Solvay, uh, especially Polymers here in Augusta, did 100 learning teams that, that were employee led in the course of one year. 100 learning teams in one year. And the, the project manager for the, that particular um, company had, you know, he, he just kept track of how many they did. And this company, which had killed, uh, three workers in a, in a maintenance turnaround three years earlier and then got bought out by Solvay, um, ended up returning to profitability very quickly. Um, and the, the project manager for that company uh, attributes it all to the learning teams of his employees. So while learning teams will help you in terms of safety, they also significantly help you, and, and this is underscored both by United Rentals and Bechtel, they help you with profitability because they find areas where that gap between work is imagined and work is done is pretty wide and you've got lots of variability and, and all those things impact on profitability. So again, uh, if you're seeing areas where you're losing money, that's a good place to do it as well, not just the areas where you think you're hurting people. So the, in the, the second step is you gather your team, uh, ideally with some kind of a facilitator who knows what they're doing. 
uh, you tell them what's going on, you set some goals. Uh, typically, these sessions don't take very long, like less than a week. <coughs> and the facilitator does some instruction on this new view versus the old view thinking. You tell them, we're not going to come up with solutions. We're going to ask a lot of how questions, not why questions. And the first thing that we do is we describe what normal work looks like. So you come into work, what happens is shift turnover, who makes breakfast, how do you do this, you know, all those sorts of things. And then uh, you start transitioning into what happened, uh, what were the conditions that were in place on the day of this event? And, and as you start writing them down, you realize, holy crap, there was a lot going on that day that was different from normal work. Or there were some things that were different that were slightly different and that made all the difference in the world as it, as it related to that event. But you're still not into solutions. So the so what you do is, uh, and this typically takes a couple of hours, then you, you knock off for about a day and you let the learning soak in. And, and I didn't used to do this, but I, I realized that having that soak time was important because you sleep on it and you start learning stuff in your sleep. Um, it's a good idea for the learning team to go out and gather other information that you think you need. It's also okay to bring in other members. You know, like you might want to bring another planner in, or you might want to bring in an engineer or a chemist or, you know, whoever you think you need to help explain things that you didn't understand on the first day. So you come back for the second session, you recap what you thought you learned, you add new thoughts, and generally, this is where the real learning takes place. And and you start putting the pieces together, and the story emerges from your learning team, and you begin to think, "Holy crap! I I didn't I I, I didn't know as much as I thought I knew about work uh, before this happened." So at that point, it's uh, time to define solutions, and you're going to action. And so the first thing you do is you do essentially a barrier analysis and you look at, okay, what were we relying on uh, to prevent this event from happening in the first place? And it may, be, it may have been work control, it might have been a pre-job brief, it might have been physical barriers or controls, you know, whatever. And you start looking at the efficacy of those barriers. You know, did they work or didn't they? Had, the, had there been a workaround? Um, were they inoperative and you didn't know it? Um, so you look at that and you go, okay, how, how did these barriers not work the way we thought they did? How do, or how did we allow barriers to become inoperative without our knowing it? Or were these barriers absolute caca? In other words, you know, we're placing false hope in, uh, in these barriers that we had, and we've really got to build other barriers. Um, so, so now what do you do? Well, my experience is, is you tell these teams uh, without um, taking into account either cost or schedule, figure out what would it, uh, very effectively keep this from happening again. And when you remove those barriers from their thinking, they become very creative. And, and I've, I have yet to have a team, when you remove those barriers, not come up with very cost-effective and timely solutions to these problems. Um, go ahead and micro-experiment to see what works and what doesn't. That's perfectly okay. Um, and, and, but the idea is, is take the learning barriers, learning constraints off the learning team, and figuring out what do you need to do. So now you get into um, solutions and you, and this is where you bring in management. Uh, so that between management and the team, you've got to mutually agree on what you need to do. And managers need to get involved in this because they've got the resources. And, and so they're pretty important, right? So then you got to figure out, do we do this right now or do we it later? Um, there's a story in, in the Six Sigma training world about a company that used to ship out 
very you know high end perfumes and every now and again and they had an automated filling system uh on their assembly line and every now and again they chip out a box of perfume that a customer would pay for they'd get it and it would be empty so these things you know these bottles would cost you know a hundred dollars a bottle and the obviously the customers were unhappy and so management got with a bunch of engineers to figure out what they could do on the assembly line to keep this from happening again and and engineering determined okay we need a project it's going to cost about a million bucks we're going to radiograph every, every one of the the um, the boxes to make sure that it's absolutely filled with a you know a filled bottle of perfume and so they're on the the assembly line or the yeah the assembly line looking at it and they were talking about it and one of the workers came over to the team and they said well i i don't know what you all are talking about because the guys here on the floor have already fixed that problem and what they did was they realized that a bottle or a box that didn't have a bottle of perfume in it didn't weigh very much so they just put a, a fan on the assembly line and if an empty box would were to pass by it would just blow it off the line and it wouldn't be shipped so that was a 38 dollar solution that was um, as effective as the million dollar solution that engineering came up with so in that particular regard workers you know they're not engineers they're not scientists but they know how the work gets done and they're the closest to the work and they're the first people that you should go to um, but sometimes workers don't fix problems and it's i think it's because of your culture and they feel well it's not my job or i'll get in trouble if i fix it or i don't have the authority to fix it so we want to eliminate that by getting workers engaged so that these um this reluctance to fix things goes away. Then the last thing you want to do is you want to communicate it to others. Um, and so learning teams do a couple of things for your company. First, they give workers the confidence to work safely after a, a real upset. Uh, upset. Because as soon as you have an accident and somebody gets hurt, you'll notice the work productivity goes way down. And that's because workers don't have their confidence in themselves to work safely. The second thing that learning teams do is they give the company the capacity to work more safely. So you want to look at the capacity to work safely. Then what you want to be able to do and why you communicate this is to determine if you've got the same condition that exists someplace else. Or is there a cause out there that exists someplace else. So you want to look at extent of condition or extent of cause. So to recap, here's our phases, one through seven, figure out whether you need one or not, or, or not. bring in your team, start in learning, team, uh, learning mode only, ask how questions, start with uh, how does the work, what, what does the normal work day look like, and then transition to the day of the event. Provide a little bit of soak time, preferably about a day, Second session, build the story of what's going to happen, of what you think happened, and then start um, transitioning from learning to action. Define your defenses, build new ones, uh, and, and then track your actions for criteria and closure and communicate it to the rest of the company. All right. Um, some considerations on these learning teams. Um, and I've learned this. Uh, by having done this a lot, the, um, these learning teams will often conflict with management's well-established well confirmation bias or um, what they call it, fundamental attribution error, um, where managers believe that because they're better educated, they're smarter, they're better looking, what have you, that you know they know better about how work happens than workers um, and learning teams really come in conflict with that notion so that's something that the team really needs to be aware of whoever facilitates it uh, certainly should understand this because the desire to blame and punish is a very powerful uh, incentive for managers because when you're blaming and punishing others, you're not taking a hard look at what did I do to encourage, allow, um, or, or allow this uh, 
or enable this event to happen in the first place. So when I was a chief engineer of a nuclear aircraft carrier, bad things would happen all the time. And I didn't blame the, the folks working for me. I instead would, I'd be at the critique and, uh, and I'd point the finger of blame at myself and I'd, I'd ask out loud, okay, what did I do to encourage, allow, or enable this thing to happen in the first place? And I would find that there were things that I had done. Um, and, and it's not that everybody else was blame free, it's that when the boss starts pointing the finger of blame at himself, then others in the organization are really very willing to step up and go, well, boss, you know, yeah, you certainly contributed to this, but here's what I did. Um, and very, you know, I'd say it, it's not never, but it's very rare that you, you end up having any kind of discipline or punishment comes out of it. Um, but again, what I've noticed in very technical organizations where the leaders of those organizations are engineers or scientists, Newton's third law really gets in the way because it forms the basis for how engineers and scientists and technical people really look at the world. And they look at things like root cause and that becomes very, um, you know, very sexy to them. And so they, you know, they want to, uh, use Newton to, to go back to the person who touched it last uh, to, to go, okay, well, the person who touched it last was the root cause, because if they hadn't touched it, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, the reality is, is that, that whoever touched it last was merely unlucky. And so if, if you're relying on luck uh, as a defense, uh, you're probably not very good. Um, so those these are some things I've learned over the years. Um, I've, I've learned a lot from learning teams. They're, um, it, it's an investment of time, but not much. And what you get is you get an engagement from your workers. And, and I think the guy from United Rentals talked about this in the last um, podcast that I, that I listened to. Um, it, it's it's amazing what you get when you start begin engaging all these brains of the folks that are working for you. And the learning teams is the best thing I'm, I know of to get that engagement, all right? So what is, uh, what's the role of workers or of managers and supervisors in, um, um, in accident and event investigation, just trying to learn? Well, one of my uh, mentors is a fellow by the name of Sidney Decker, who's written many uh, books on the subject. He says, to understand failure, we must understand our reaction to failure. So if somebody brings you bad news and you've got that look on your face like somebody just farted, that tells people, oh, don't bring the boss bad news. Because if that's your reaction, they're gonna do whatever it takes to not bring you bad news. So instead, when somebody brings you bad news, you go, thank you, I needed to know that. Um, because the reality is, is management can't fix what they don't know. So if people aren't bringing you bad news, it may be because your reaction to bad news is inappropriate. And Decker goes on to say, people don't operate in a vacuum where they can decide and act all powerfully. To err or not to err is not a choice. Instead, people's work is subject to and constrained by multiple factors. So have you ever been in a movie, you know, one of these teenage uh, monster movies and, you know, and, and Jason is behind the closet door and he's got an ax in his hand and the, the teenage girl is, is moving up on the door and she's gonna hide behind, you know, in the closet and everybody in the, in the theater hears this music playing, you know, and it's Jason's music. And you're all screaming at the screen, you know, don't open the door. Well, the same is true for these workers. In, in 2020 hindsight, we 
in management supervision are looking at what happened and we know how it ends. We know what happens when the girl opens the door and Jason's behind it. We know what happens. Um, and so we believe that that we would have done something differently. And, and that again is fundamental attribution error. Um, the reality is, is we, you know, we can hear the music and the person who touched it last didn't hear it. So we've got to not only put ourselves in the shoes of the worker who touched it last, we've got to turn off the music that's playing in the background of our heads and look at it uh, freshly. So we're looking at it moving forward, not in a retrospective view. So now, here's some things that you know, I found that really good organizations do very well. Uh, the first is they can look around corners. They can predict the next failure and they're really good at it. And, and where they're good at it is especially they're talking to their people going, hey, where's our next, where's the risk coming up? The second thing they do is you know, our, our worlds in hoisting and rigging and, and oil and gas and, you know, whatever else you're doing out in your companies is complicated. But these companies that do these four things very well are really good at taking that complication out at the work face. So where the workers are touch, physically touching the company, they reduce that operational complication. And they're good at it. The third thing they do is when a near hit happens. So that's that precursor data. They respond emotionally and with urgency because they know that there's, you know, maybe one defense between that particular non-event and a catastrophe, you know, like a load dropping or a crane tipping over or what have you. Um, but then the last thing is when actual events happen, they respond very deliberately. So when I was chief engineer of the Nimitz, um, and before when I was the damage control assistant of the Nimitz, I experienced two very uh, major flight deck fires. The first one, 14 people were killed and 40 were very badly burned. And the second one, two, pe two people were killed and nobody was injured. Um, and in these particular cases, the flight deck was on fire. We had explosives that were cooking off, uh, bombs and missiles. Uh, we had people that were dying. Um, and we responded very calmly and deliberately in the control room um, because we needed to keep our heads. And that's what the very best companies do, is that when bad things actually happen, uh, they don't respond emotionally. They respond very deliberately in how they do things. So that's what I'd like to leave you with um, is this notion that, um, you know, here's some things that the really good companies do. And I'm not suggesting that this is a way to do it. I'm just saying that these companies learned how to learn. They you had to uh, differentiate Newtonian physics from cognitive psychology, okay, from that six inches of gray matter between your ears, you know, because that six inches of gray matter between your ears doesn't follow the laws of physics. So, um, but that's what I'd like you to leave with, you with is, is this notion that, yeah, Newton is, was good for a lot of things, but in the area of accident investigations and learning, he really gets in the way. And so think about, you know, when bad things happen, are you more interested in hurting somebody um, or, you know, to create a scapegoat or do you really want to learn and improve because you can't do both? All right, well, I'm done and uh, Here's a picture of a, a little meerkat. And are there any questions?
Hey, Bill, we do have um, a couple thank you, first of all. Um, good stuff, as always. And I think, um, yeah, this is it. You make people think <laughs> to, to keep it simple. So that, that's the goal here. Um, and it's a, maybe think differently um, or just not fall into the same traps that we've seen before. So appreciate it as always. Um, I'll start off with one question. Uh, this is from Steve. He is just, well, I can summarize it. Generally just wondering if you're not coming from a position um, as a supervisor or a manager, how do you get supervisors and managers to uh, buy into some of the ideas that you mentioned and he's looking for um, specific techniques or examples if you can provide them well one of the things that we did in my last company was we would do parallel learning teams with root cause analyses and and what we would find is is these learning teams would come up with a story so, so when you read, uh, especially within the Department of Energy, um, when you look at the root cause analysis, you get done reading it, and it might be 100 pages long. You're not really certain what actually happened on the day of the event. And when you read a learning team report, and most of these learning team reports are about four to six pages long, and I've never seen one longer than 10 pages. Um, when you read it, you go through it and you go, holy crap, the, the, there was nothing that this person could have done other than what they did based on the information that they had available to them. And, and in one particular case, um, <clears throat> and Todd writes about it in his book, but, but when it happened, he called me up to, to uh, tell me about it and it was very interesting. He was working with a high-end um, uh, appliance manufacturer and one day a uh, forklift driver ended up boogering up a forklift as he was loading uh, goods onto you know the product onto trucks in the in the loading dock and the the plant manager sent him home for a week without pay um, and so they did a learning team on this and when they got done they realized that this operator, this forklift operator, could have done nothing other than what he did, based on what was, you know, the information that he had available to him. The plant manager called him up at home, brought him back to the plant, and the guy thought he was going to get fired. The plant manager apologized to him, returned, yeah, you know, basically made good, uh, gave him all his back pay, and said, "I want you to tell this story to everybody." And I want you to work on the learning team to come up with a solution so that this doesn't happen again. And they did. And this particular company was one of the higher profitability companies uh, within this corporation. And at the end of a year, they had increased their profitability by 100%. So the, the first thing that you want to do is you want to look at how easy is it to tell the story. And the second thing is, is you want to be able to demonstrate um, improved profitability by reduced risk as a result of doing learning teams. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there are a couple other questions, um, more general stuff that I can handle. Uh, a couple of people have asked if the slide deck will be made available. Um, it will, as well as the recording of the session. Um, give us about 24 hours or a business day to uh, get that in line, and we'll post that. And just um, so by registering, we'll send the link out automatically to everybody once it's ready. Um, but uh, other than that, um, Bill, if you can move to the next slide just briefly, I want to give the folks a, a bit more information. So. The, the type of discussion we had today, um, as well as much, much more, um, is available in more of a formal course setting. There are two HPI, Human Performance Improvement, classes coming up um, from ITI, um, taught by Bill. They're going to be in, um, should be quite warm, uh, Houston <laughs> in July. Um, but one is a workshop, a one-day workshop that's um, we'll go over some of the ideas similar to what we talked about today, uh, more of an overview of 
uh, HPI. And then a second is a two-day course that is um, based on accident investigation specifically. And I'll dive into some of the, um, the topics much deeper and uh, should be great. So you can learn more about those at iti.com slash HPI. Um, and if you have any questions, we're always available. Um, info at iti.com or um, yeah, just visiting the website. So I think uh, we are good for the day. I wanted to make sure everybody saw this. You see Bill's contact information there as well. Um, no, again, thank you, Bill. I appreciate you, ha thank you. having you on. And uh, yeah, if you have anything to say to the folks online there. Well, I've enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, um, it, this is a pretty common theme for me, but for most folks and, and in the hoisting and rigging industry and a lot of heavy industries that ITI serves, uh, as you're becoming increasingly more regulated um, and and bad things really happen, um, it, this is something that helps you to understand, here's what happened and the the tried, you know, the tried and true things that we've done in the past, which is name, blame, shame, do some training and write another procedure uh, probably haven't worked for us in the past. And and hopefully this will get you beyond that to start looking at, at really effective ways to improve your safety capacity, your ability to, you know, uh, withstand errors without any consequence and, and uh, improve your profitability. So, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jonah. Perfect. Okay, thanks to everybody, too, for joining. Um, look out for our next showcase webinar. Uh, we should have information posted here pretty soon. And that'll be it. So everybody enjoy the rest of your day and your week. And just remember, there's no substitute for doing it right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.